Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Kelton. I'm with the REA on the Farm and Agribusiness Management Team. Today I just want to cover a little bit about industrial hemp, the risk management, and some of the economics behind um, what's driving our market right now. Okay, so most of you are aware that in 2014, that's when we had the Farm Bill pass that allowed for states to legalize some um, pilot programs for industrial hemp. That's kind of where we started our research. As you know, Alabama was not one of those states that participated in that, but we had several surrounding states that did participate. Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina are all states that ran these pilot programs. Now in 2018, when the Farm Bill was passed that allowed for um, commercial production of industrial hemp, then uh, this allowed for most of our states to start producing hemp. Alabama started producing. Um, our first crop was in 2019 under the 2018 Farm Bill, um, but we're still operating under the pilot program until the 2018 um, bill is passed for our state program. Um, some of the things that are different for the 2018 Farm Bill is that uh, one of the issues we had originally was interstate travel restrictions between state to state. They had different testing methods. Um, plant material could be under the 0.3 level in the state they were leaving, but then go into another state and have um, issues and get um, confiscated. It also allows for hemp to have banking options. At this point, I don't know of any private lenders that are working with hemp growers, but FSA has stated that they will allow operating loans to be um, secured for growers for um, hemp in 2020. And then it also establishes some crop insurance. Um, some of the the that's available for the crop insurance is there. It will have NAP coverage and that's through FSA. I don't know the specifics on that. You could visit the individual FSA office, but they're also working with a multi, uh, multi peril crop insurance program that is a pilot program and it will be available in almost all of the states in Alabama or all of the counties in Alabama. Uh, one of the issues is that right now I understand that you'll have to have crop insurance, um, and you will you will have to have a um, contract to sell or to have it per your hemp purchased before you can um, qualify for that insurance. But um, those will be options for 2020 production. Um, the it, one of the issues was we had some um, to have to have clarification on how these rules were going to be implemented. Now that wasn't published until the end of roughly October of 2019. Those rules came out. Um, so there's still a lot in the 2018 Farm Bill that's not un well understood and we'll probably continue to have um, updates as we move forward with um, industrial hemp. So just kind of give you an idea of what our hemp production looks like throughout the U.S. You can kind of see here on the map that um, the states in blue were the ones that were um, initially growing and then those kind of in the yellow are the ones who now have um, hemp in their the state as of um, 2019. The, the main thing to take away from this is the number of acres we've had. If you look at your total for 2017, we had um, 25,000 acres that were certified and had a license to produce on. Now, if you look at 2018, that number goes up to 78,000. Now, again, remember, these are just licensed acres, and we all know that there were a lot of issues, um, depending on what year we're looking at it, um, weather related, or um, cost prohibitive that people weren't able to plant all of those acres um, that were licensed. And so now that we have, where you have to certify your acres through FSA, I think we'll have a better understanding actually how many acres are planted. But then if you look for 2019, here are the estimates of the acres we had in the US, and that's 511,000 acres that we had planted or licensed to grow. So you can see there's a tremendous jump in the number of acres across the US that we had and that really kind of drives that supply and demand with that number of acres going from 78,000 to 511,000 just in one year. We have increased the tre uh, tremendously increased the amount of hemp we have available. Um, particularly, most of this is going into CBD production. So that if you've watched the markets and watched the price of hemp, you can really see why that that um, price has dropped so fast because of just the, the supply we have. Now, again, that is just licensed acres and the numbers I've seen roughly estimate about 350 of those were actually planted or 350,000 of those were actually planted. Um, not sure exactly how many of those were actually harvested, but again, 
tremendous increase, which pushes those prices down. So like I said, most of that was for CBD production. There are several types of production for industrial hemp. We, again, by and large for Alabama, we had all of it planted to CBD, but there's also the fiber and the seed side, and all of those have different production methods. Um, if you're growing for CBD, majority of people are planting seedlings or transplants, but if you're growing for seed or for fiber, then you're planting um, a lot higher seeding rate, a lot closer together on the plants. Um, but again, these that your seeds are gonna be a lot less expensive for the fiber and seed uh, market. So um, one of the main things I want you to remember too is that um, the demand for CBD has um, really been what's pushed the, the hemp production for the, um, that type of production. But as we move forward with the industrial hemp market, if we continue to have infrastructure put in place so that we can use fiber products, I think that we'll see um, an increase in interest in growing for the fiber and for the seed. I, most of those returns are not gonna be as high as what we were seeing two years ago for CBD production, but they could still be uh, another option for people who are, are wanting to grow hemp. So when we talk about risk management, one of the main things we have to think about are, well, everything in ag is kind of a risk, but what do you wanna to do to kind of hedge your bets and mitigate those risks that you're gonna face? And there's all kinds of risk, whether it's production risk, financial risk, um, just how the human risk of, of this. Um, so things you have to think about before you even plant are some of the decisions you have to make that kind of um, gives you a little bit of um, risk management for some of the, the things you're gonna do. So when we talk about that for production risk, how am I going to manage my production strategy so that I'm not counting on one specific production practice to make all of my money? So essentially not putting all your eggs in one basket. So things you have to think about um, on production decisions. And I'm not gonna go too in depth on this because I know there are some other um, webinars that are gonna be out there that kind of cover a lot on the production side. Things you have to think about, your bare ground or plastic. What strain or strains are you going to, to grow? Um, am I gonna use seed or seedlings or am I gonna use clones? Um, the main thing you have to think about, if you're a large enough operation, if you can kind of diversify, if you have some bare ground versus plastic, particularly in your first year, what works best for you. Um, that way you're not just relying solely on one production strategy to make it. Because again, we're, we're new at this and we don't know exactly what is going to be the best. Um, we don't know on strains which ones are going to work best, particularly across the state. South Alabama versus North Alabama may have a different outcome depending on what strain we plant. You also need to be careful too when you're listening to advice from other, um, other states. If their climates are different and they've had great um, if they've had some success with a particular strain, it may or may not uh, yield the same here. Um, but then also too, some of your management decisions may be decided by who you're using as your processor. Right now, Alabama doesn't mandate that a hemp grower have a um, you know, heavy metal soil test or test for herbicides or pesticides in the soil. But if your processor um, wants that, it's gonna be difficult to go back after the fact and have those tests run, if they come up where your processor doesn't wanna work with you, then that could be an issue. So you, and, and two, we have a lot of, um, they're working to approve some pesticides to be used in hemp. If your processor doesn't want to accept hemp with those pesticides being sprayed, then that really kind of limits you if that's who you decided is gonna be your processor and you don't have a backup plan. So things to think about going into production, what kind of practices am I gonna do? And can I diversify those practices so that I'm not just counting on one production practice? There's a lot of risk too on the on production side. Um, and I know one of the main things we see are weed issues. Definitely want to stay on top of that. Um, insects and disease pressure as well. The other things, um, THC spikes, we're not sure exactly what the um, weather will do or drought or extreme rain, if those will cause any kind of THC spikes. Um, but it's something to, to think about. But water use requirements. For most of our um, established commodities, we have kind of an idea of what our, our water use requirements are gonna be. But for hemp, we're not sure yet. Again, that comes with years of research. We just don't have that. Also on the fertility requirements, you may be working with a processor or working with um, like a, a co-op of growers and you may have fertility um, and management practices that are established. 
but um, things you have to think about. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna handle these requirements? Because we don't have a just a, a specific set of, of instructions for growing hemp in Alabama. Then if you can get through the production side of that, how am I gonna harvest? Um, there's a lot of decisions you have to make with that and there's some risks that come along with both of them. For hand harvest versus mechanical, we've seen some growers who had um, the implements to harvest mechanically. We had issues with uniformity across the field, which made mechanical harvest very difficult. If you're gonna hand harvest, do I have access to um, the number of people to actually go out there and, and hand harvest? And then drying, there's so many different options out there. We don't have a set way of working with the drying. Um, so the people have come up with some in innovative ways to handle that. Uh, again, thinking about across the, the country, there are places where they're able to, or they're cutting and leaving in the field to dry, definitely not something we can do in Alabama. But uh, there are a lot of different options out there and people are just having to try to figure out which one's gonna work best. Some of our surrounding states have been able to kind of adapt to that fairly quickly because they're, they were used to growing tobacco and they had the tobacco drying barns. We don't have that. So you have to have a plan in place going into this. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna handle um, when we get to harvest and drying? So after we've gotten it out of the field, what do we need to think about? Well, we need to think about it before we, we actually even plant, but once we get, get to the point where we have a crop to, heart, uh, to market, um, it's very difficult. There's no standardized market. There's no um, readily available information. If you look on um, USDA NAS, where we get our, a lot of our statistics and we can see some of our prices, there's just not a lot out there because it is a new market. Um, so it's very difficult to know exactly what those prices are gonna run uh, for retail versus wholesale. And then um, not just on the pricing of where, where am I, where am I getting my information from on the market? But then um, processors, we have very few processors in the state. There are several that are supposed to be online for this year. Um, I don't know the capacity of, of all of these markets. I don't know any kind of restrictions they'll have for any of the growers that they're gonna work with. Um, and, and as the prices continue to fluctuate, it's very difficult to know at, Know, at what point uh, do I need to sign a contract? If you can sign a contract, and a lot of processors are not going to do contracts going into 2020 uh, just because of the issues they had for 2019. And then competition. Remember, we are competing against a lot of other states that have had production for several years since 2014. They've had the trial and error years. We're competing against those growers. And then if you're small acreage, it's going to be even more difficult to, to contract with processors who may have um, limits on how small of a, uh, of a grower they'll work with because if they can um, get a large majority from a, of what they need, a lot of their supply from several larger operations, then it may be in their best interest to go with those larger operations as opposed to a number of smaller growers. So finding who you're going to market through, what your marketing plan for hemp, if, if you have that in place before you ever plant, um, it's going to be important going into harvest that you have a, a marketing strategy figured out. I think every time we have a meeting, we talk about financial risk, and this is something that all of us say um, just because it is such a high risk, and there are a lot of unknowns in industrial hemp. We don't want to discourage anyone from growing, but we also want you to understand what kind of financial risk this is. Is it um, quite expensive for each acre you establish. So we always encourage anybody who is thinking about growing hemp to not invest more than they're willing to walk away from. If it's gonna cost you $13,000 an acre to establish this, yes, there's a risk that you could walk away having lost $13,000. So we don't want anyone taking everything they have and investing in this and um, losing out because the market is not stable or for whatever reason you're not able to recoup your money just want everyone to be aware that there are a lot of financial risk in this and it is an investment cost a huge investment cost um, again you know 2018 farm bill uh, addressed this opening up lines of credit through banks but private banks have to be willing to give those um, lines of credit hopefully we'll see that uh, who knows if we will see that anytime soon um, again, some of the insurance is in place, but it's not a complete protection. Most of the insurance um, 
that's going to be available will not cover if you test hot. If you go above that 0.3 level, you probably not have any payments from any of your crop insurances that are available. Um, so there are some, some restrictions on the insurance. It does get, give you some level of protection, but it's not going to completely protect everything that you've invested in this. Then you have to think about the legal side of this. I read something this morning that said there were a lot of issues with theft out of fields. Um, so you have, you know, having some kind of, uh, there's going to be a lot of legal and um, human risk along with this uh, crop. It's just not like any other commodity we've planted before. Um, we do advise people if you enter into a contract, which they may be very difficult to get, but if you do make sure you have legal um, counsel on how those contracts are, are set up so that you're protecting your, yourself. Um, there's some issues with regulatory changes. What are those gonna look like if the FDA regulates CBD? Um, right now, there's not a regulation on it, but we know that there are. Uh, there is one prescription drug that contains CBD. Does that mean that FDA, the FDA will get involved and regulate this to any degree? We're not sure, but it's a potential there. And like I said, on the, the human side of this, uh, theft is a, could be a potential um, major issue, depending on where you are, how close you are to roads, um, and so yes, um, dealing with working with other people coming into your field could be a major pro problem. Not only is that going to be an issue, but if you have to uh, invest in some kind of security, it's just going to increase your investment cost into this crop. So the main thing, what's our economic uh, payoff from growing industrial hemp? Now this is a very difficult topic to get into just because month over month that CBD price continues to drop. Now it's very difficult to predict when that price is going to kind of um, slow down on the decline or you know kind of level out. Will it level out if we get processors in place? Will there be a de uh, continued demand for CBD um, on the from consumers? So um, the main thing when you're looking at a budget, the budget is just there as kind of an estimate. It's kind of a guideline. It's going to be something that you need to adjust for your individual um, operation. So the numbers I show are going to be just estimates and you will need to go in and adjust those for your operation. So when we talk about a budget, we look at variable costs and you can see at the top of this, um, variable costs are like $13,000. Um, we kind of separate for a budget. We look at variable costs versus fixed cost. Your variable costs are all the cost that you actually spend money to establish that crop. So your seedlings, um, your fertilizer, the um, anything you pay to have that planted and harvested as far as labor, those are all your variable costs. And then your fixed costs are those costs that you're gonna have to pay regardless if you plant or not. So kind of if you if you've already bought a tractor and then you decide not to plant, then you still have those tractor payments. Those kinds of costs are your fixed costs. So you can see the majority of the cost for this are, are going to fall under variable cost. Um, but then just to think about those fixed costs, um, I will say this now, there are the um, budgets are available on our website at aces.edu. You can go there and go into farming and you should be able to find those um, budgets for hemp. It's available as a PDF as well as a um, spreadsheet, then that spreadsheet is adjustable so that you can change those numbers to reflect your operation. But so what are our returns? And when we look at our returns, we typically look at returns above variable cost, just because the majority of your costs are associated with your variable cost. The last time I looked at these budgets and, and adjusted numbers, kind of our average number was um, $1.75 per pound. Um, and on the, if you look at this table, you can kind of see where those uh, returns are. If you're aiming for average of $1.75 with 1,350, that should be pounds per acre, um, then you're clearing about $5,000. Now this was in December when I uh, adjusted the budgets, but now we already have already seen that price, your average price. The last time I looked at the price, it had adjusted to about a dollar per pound. So that's based on um, percent of CBD content. So you can kind of see where, um, yes, there's money to be made, but as those prices continue to drop, then your returns above what you're spending get less and less. Um, there's a lot of expenses associated with this. Your major ones are gonna be your transplants or your seedling cost, and then your labor. It is extremely labor intensive 
And so you have to have, make sure that you have labor available to you to get this through um, planting, through the production time and through harvest. And then um, irrigation costs, drying costs, which are gonna depend on how you have that system set up. And then licensing fees and, and all that are, are gonna add up to, to what um, cost you're gonna incur. Like I said before, we have limited research that, and um, 2020 will have more research within the state specific, but until then, I do urge you to visit some of the extension websites from surrounding states. Uh, Kentucky is a very good resource, as is Clemson. I don't have the NC uh, states website up here, but it is also a good resource. Again, remember though, these are gonna be state specific, and so not all of this information is going to really translate to the same performance as it would for, for those states. So, you know, strain advice and, and yields are probably not gonna work exactly the same for Alabama, but those are good resources to start with. So that's what I've got. Feel free to email me, call me if you have any information or uh, any questions, I'll be happy to help. Um, again, do a lot of research, do a lot of homework. Uh, it is a huge investment and we, we want to make sure that everybody who's planning gets into this um, and they're successful with it. So thank you.